Oh God, I hate it when it does that. Anyway, I, I had started this live a couple minutes ago and it started broadcasting sideways again and, and that's a, a common mistake with the iPhone. Sometimes the, you know, the tilt indicator doesn't pick up. Um, I was talking about the wonderful time we had. Oh, by the way, if you're just tuning in, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm a lawyer with Allegheny Immigration Group in Pittsburgh. Uh, my practice is primarily humanitarian and family-based immigration. The telephone number at Allegheny Immigration Group is 412-586-4131. And uh, I was going to do a live today, but first I had some, some Allegheny Immigration Group news. And the first thing I was going over, and I'm going to go over again, was the wonderful time we had at the Pittsburgh International and Immigrant Communities Festival uh, last Friday night, and that was Friday the 13th, believe it or not. This is a, a, a couple times a year they have this festival. Um, it's to foster community development and inclusiveness, but it was just a blast. It was a beautiful night. There was a bunch of amazing bands, uh, Calypso, Caribbean, uh, a very strong African and Asian. It, just, it was an eclectic mix, but they were all fun and people were dancing. There was uh, a lot of vendors of international wares and very exotic and delicious foods. And of course, because it was in Market Square, where, which is a tourist venue anyway, all the bars and everything were open, so if you wanted to go in and have a, uh, an adult beverage, you could do that. So it was just a really nice time. We were something of a non-traditional vendor in that we weren't selling anything. I mean, perhaps we are promoting our firm, but we were giving out uh, a lot of immigration guides, literature, aids, things to help people uh, with their immigration needs, things to explain stuff. And understanding, of course, can always go a long way toward cutting down fear factor and making it easier to learn things. Uh, but that was a really nice time. And uh, if anybody's interested, of course, some of you guys did come uh, last Friday, and that was great. And I thank you, all of you that came. It was fun. We're going to be doing that again on Friday the 27th. That'll be from 5 to 10 p.m. That's in Market Square in downtown Pittsburgh. If you're from out of town and you want to put it in GPS, I would probably type in something around 210 Forbes. I think that is the address of uh, a Mexican restaurant that's right at the entrance to Market Square. It, uh, it ends probably at 10. Uh, the people take the booths down, so you can still have your Market Square later at night. But that's a good time. And I encourage you all to come. Um, let me see. Now, text message there. Okay, so next, the next time it runs again is on the 27th of September. That's the Friday after next. It will be again from 5 to 10 p.m. And that'll be the last time it runs this year. So if you wanted to come out and see us or talk to me in person in a less formal, more relaxed, almost festive party environment, uh, and be, it's, it's quiet enough that we could talk, uh, that would be a good time to do it. It's, it's free, free legal advice, free answers to your questions, presuming we can answer them there on the spot and they're not too complicated. And we will again have immigration guides. We may even have um, uh, a game where you can try and pass the citizenship test. You'd be surprised at how difficult that is. Uh, even most Americans who've ever seen it um, conclude that they probably wouldn't be able to do it themselves if ever put to the test. But uh, again, if anybody needs directions, if, if you wanted to come to that, you can call the office, 412-586-4131. Or, of course, you can leave a message on here. You can send a, a DM to Allegheny Immigration Group over Facebook. Uh, and that's, uh, that, but you're really welcome to, to attend. And again, there'll be free takeaways, uh, immigration help, advice, guides, uh, and then the usual office premiums emblazoned with our logo. And that includes balloons, coffee cups, pens, t-shirts, stuff of that nature. Uh, if you like these videos, I do ask that you please like, share them even better. Uh, we're trying to increase our footprint here, especially now there's a lot of fear in the immigration space. And we're here to try and help you through that, um, deal with a lot of the uncertainty and confusion and uh, in some cases outright lies that are being propagated on television, in the news media, by political types. Um, obviously if you call us we'll give you the straight dope because that's our job. Um, we, all right, next item, we are accepting new clients. We've had a backlog, there was a lot of people that came through and really overloaded our ability to do immigration work, uh, primarily in spring, and I'm not complaining, if, if you were in that group I was glad to have you. 
Um, but that inevitably meant that in order to keep the quality of our work up, we had to turn some people down who wanted things done. If anybody did get turned down and still has an immigration need, certainly come back to us. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, my staff has really kind of uh, pitched in here. We've really kicked up our game, and, and we're in a position now to accept new clients and deliver the same quality of service that we've always delivered. So if you have an immigration need or you know somebody that has an immigration need, uh, we, we'd love to hear from them or hear from you. Um, if, if there's a language problem, we'll get interpreters in. We have a lot of people that volunteer and intern with us in that space, interpreting, working for an American law firm. A lot of people are liking to have that on their credentials. But we'll get someone who speaks to you in your language and we will make sure you understand what's going on. And as always, we listen to you, we explain things to you, and we support you through the process, whatever that may be. Um, again, I ask that you like and share. If you want to call us, the number is 412-586-4131. We practice primarily humanitarian and family-based immigration. And that's all over uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland. Uh, we do some work in Minneapolis. We have uh, a nice bunch of people in Seattle. And if you're watching, you know who you are. Hello. Um, there's also some San Francisco work that's winding down now. But we're certainly happy to visit the city by the bay if you have needs out there. And we're familiar with um, the process and procedure out that way. Now let's see if there's anything else that's interesting of news. Again, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm an immigration lawyer with Allegheny Immigration Group in Pittsburgh. Uh, my practice is primarily family and humanitarian immigration. Our telephone number is 412-586-4131. We'd love to hear from you even if it was just a question. Uh, we're not, unfortunately, the most aggressive of the billing outfits, so a lot of times it's easy to get us to, to give free help. And, and, and more often than not, we're happy to give it. All right, other news. Um, there's been some requests lately for referrals to naturalization classes. Uh, I don't know, most of you are aware of it, but if you want to become a citizen, that process is called naturalizing. You're a naturalized citizen as opposed, uh, and that's not a second or separate class. So you, citizen is citizen is citizen. It doesn't matter how you got it. Some people get it through their parents. Some people get it through being born in the United States. And some people who neither have American parents nor were born in the United States can get their naturally get their citizenship through what's called naturalization, and that's a well, it can be a long process. But at the final stage of it, you have to go through what's called a naturalization test, and that requires that you demonstrate your ability to speak and understand and write and read the English language. Um, and the most important and sometimes the most terrifying part is what's called the civics test, and the civics tests are written questions about the United States, its history, uh, how our government's organized, and things of that nature that, uh, again, it's kind of fun. Most Americans, most natural-born Americans who are educated here can't pass it. So it, it, it's steep, especially for a foreigner. Um, but I've had a couple clients come up for naturalization. It's always a fun time. I go to the naturalization ceremonies. That's where they swear to support, defend, and uphold. And it is I will tell you if I ever get a chance to attend one, quite an emotional experience. Um, it really, I mean, I, I, well, it's emotional for me. I, uh, I get uh, very choked up at that. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, rich, uh, new, vibrant people becoming Americans and joining our incredible experiment. But the thing is, is that test, as I said, is very difficult. It's very unusual knowledge, even for Americans. And more than a few of my clients are coming up from naturalization now and are asking for help, uh, like a prep class, um, becoming naturalized. There aren't many providers of naturalization prep classes in uh, the Pittsburgh region. In fact, just the other day I did a search on the USCIS website for approved, um, they call it naturalization and assimilation classes. Um, there's only one in the city of Pittsburgh, and the second nearest one's in Ohio. So uh, there certainly is a shortage of availability of these classes. Um, I, at this point, I mean, I'm not just going to start throwing classes. I'm, I'm a lawyer, not a teacher. Uh, but I, I certainly would be willing to organize and teach those classes if there was enough interest in that. So if you're watching this and you're getting ready for naturalization, you'd like to maybe attend a class. It could be even a small class. Uh, 
because uh, I, I don't know how much demand there would be, but I'm, I'm asking for you to let me know right over this page uh, by, by a DM or even a comment if there's an interest in having me uh, or other people from my firm um, teach naturalization classes. And that would be going over the history of the United States, the structure of our government and things of that nature with you to get you up to speed and get you over that all-important test. Now, uh, let's see. Again, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm a lawyer with Allegheny Immigration Group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My practice is primarily family and humanitarian-based immigration. Our telephone number is 412-586-4131. And I'm talking now about the naturalization test and the naturalization classes. As I was just saying before I did my, you know, repeating my name and phone number, um, there's been some inquiries of me if, if anybody's interested in a naturalization class. People have been asking me, Joe, where can we get these classes? And there's not much available in Pittsburgh providing these. I know that USCIS even gives out grant money um, uh, if people are willing to teach these classes. And uh, I was just looking at some of that myself too. But more importantly, even without a grant, if there's enough interest in this, I'd be happy to, to you know, to teach that class. I, as an undergraduate, I was a political science major. I can do 100 questions. Um, but let's talk a little bit about that test because for some or, or, or many of you who plan on staying long term, it's in the future. So it's 100 questions. There, there are 100 questions that they can ask you. Um, and I have all the questions. I mean, I have the questions and the approved answers. I've already got them. So the 100, but they don't ask you 100 questions. They choose 10 at random. And out of those 10, you only have to get six correct. Once you got six correct, they stop the test. Obviously, if you were to get five wrong, um, well, that, they would stop the test then too because you failed. Um, some of the questions are, well, it's divided up in categories. The first category is principles of democracy. The second is system of government. Uh, let's see what else. I've got it right here in my hand. Uh, let's see what the other categories are. Rights and responsibilities of citizenship, very important one. Uh, American history, colonial, recent, and that's divided up into parts. And integrated civics. So examples of questions on that test include uh, how many amendments are there in the Constitution? And the answer to that, at least right now, is 27. Uh, Some other examples... Name one branch of the government, and they would accept any of the following. Uh, Congress, legislative, president, executive, courts, or judicial. Uh, That's actually only three branches. Those are just two different names for each branch. So Congress is the legislature, and they would accept either of those to describe our legislative branch of government. The president is the chief executive officer of the United States, so you could say president or executive, because he's the boss of the executive. And obviously, courts and judiciary, those are the same same thing for each other. Um, other questions, uh, let's see, how many senators are there? There's 100. Um, how long does a president serve for? Four years. So these are the sorts of things that we would go through if you wanted a class or even if you were uh, one of our, our private clients and just wanted to, you know, to go over it, we would help you with that. There's some other neat things about that test. Uh, There's two rules. I think one's called um, 50 and 20, and the other one's called 55-15. So if you're 50 years old or older and have lived in the United States for 20 years or more, you don't have to take the test. You only have to take the civics test. You don't have to take the reading, writing, speaking, and understanding English portion. And the same goes if you're 55 or older and have lived here for at least 15 years. And those are called the 50-20 and 55-15 rules. Those are exemptions from the, uh, the English language requirement. Uh, presumably, if you were of that age and had lived here for that long, you, you, you'd figured out how to get along uh, you know, after 20 years, 15 years. You'd figured out how to get along well enough on your own and, and didn't need further testing in that regard. Um, now, the, the, the actual civics test, and that's those 10 questions drawn from 100, of which you must get at least six right, the, um, 
there are exemptions possible there too, particularly medical exemptions. If you, for example, had an anxiety problem that prohibited you from taking tests, you can apply for an exemption and be exempted from um, the civics portion uh, and or the, the reading and writing portion. Uh, that certificate has to be issued by a medical doctor, that's an MD, a doctor of osteopathy, that's a DO, or a licensed clinical psychologist. So you can't get it from a social worker or um, uh, uh, some of these other you know, uh, licensed mental health care workers that don't have these diagnostic capabilities. Let me see what else I've got here. But uh, and again, if you guys have interest, if there's enough people that want uh, classes in that, I'm, I'm qualified to give those. I was a political science major as an undergraduate, and, and I spent quite a bit of time studying it. And I did graduate with honors, part of how I got into law school. So if you want someone to sit down and go over this with you, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, as, uh, as I've been repeating throughout this, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm a lawyer with Allegheny Immigration Group here in Pittsburgh. My practice is primarily family and humanitarian-based immigration. The telephone number at my office is 412-586-4131. I do ask that you like and share these videos. So please share them, and uh, particularly that really spreads our foot footprint and it uh, saves us valuable money. Uh, immigration is not exactly a high-paying business. It can be, but uh, not family and humanitarian work. So we don't have a big advertising budget. And we really do like to help people, and, and we ask you to share that if you can. Uh, now, talking about uh, that, I do encourage you, if you, have, if you yourself have an interest in the immigration space or if someone you know or care about um, has an interest or, or concern in the immigration space, our Allegheny Immigration Group Facebook website is full of videos kind of like this, uh, they're not. This is more of a, a rap session in Allegheny Immigration Group news, but a lot of my videos are, have specific topics. There's one about how to do an asylum claim. There's one about uh, the documents you'll need to prove immigration through marriage. Those, those are quite popular. Um, these are more than just fluff, but they're certainly not an effort to teach you immigration law or put you through college or, uh, although. I, I doubt I could even do it in one of these short videos to teach you really everything you need to know about something. But they are, I think, very valuable to a lot of people to uh, get the information, tips, pointers, things of that nature, even to uh, share a, a way of understanding what's going on. And, and that's a lot of what I do in my work with clients. Um, those videos have been very popular. Uh, and again, what else was interesting? There was one about visas for crime victims. People were very interested in that. Uh, one about different visa types that exist and how you can get them. So they're all on our Allegheny Immigration Group Facebook page. And you can just scroll through. They're free. There's it's absolutely no obligation. You don't, you don't have to pay us. We're not going to harass you. We might ask you to like our page, uh, which is quite free. Um, one of the most popular videos, and it's a topic that, that's very interesting right now, is the public charge rule. Now, there's a separate video where I go into uh, the new public charge rule in depth. And, and again, that, that's on the Facebook page, the Allegheny Immigration Group Facebook page. But uh, it, it was in the news again today. Mayors all over the country are, are complaining about the public charge rule and the changes to the public charge rule. Mayors, including the mayor of this city, even as recently as this morning, are decrying the public charge rule. And in fact, the public charge rule, um, as it's been kind of reinterpreted recently, and is, is explained in my, my video about the public charge rule, um, is in a sense, um, does favor wealthy people in immigration. And that, that's, that's just a fact. Uh, it particularly discriminates against, and when I use discriminate, that, that's, that word's got a negative connotation. But it says that people that use, while they're here in the United States, certain forms of social benefit programs, cash assistance, SNAP, I think was one of them, and they use a certain number of uh, years of them or, or amount of money, can become inadmissible. And I'll give you the example of someone who enters the United States on a tourist visa and is unable to support themselves in the United States and in, in order to live here has to apply for social services. Um, 
the, the new rule kind of reflects the uh, the present government administration's idea that if you're going on welfare immediately, we, we probably don't want you adjusting and becoming a permanent resident and then a citizen. And in that way, as I said, the, that makes our immigration system, which historically has been one of the freest and most privileged, neutral, and most open immigration systems in, in, in the world, and even the history of the world, but it does make our immigration system um, less so in those regards because, again, it's tightening it up. You can't come in here and just start taking up welfare. It'll, it'll be consequences. You won't be able, they won't throw you right out, but you'll no longer be able to extend your stay or switch to another status. Uh, and that's called becoming inadmissible. Our immigration law, uh, which is called the Immigration and Nationality Act, has a section called Section 212. And that's the grounds for inadmissibility. And what it says is that certain types of people, uh, and, and they're, they're identified in there, can't be admitted to the United States. Now, that sounds pretty serious. So who would they say can't be admitted? Well, one is people with serious health problems. Obviously, if someone was carrying some horrible communicable disease, I, I, I wouldn't know, but something that was obvious, uh, tuberculosis, uh, was an example, that person would be inadmissible to the United States because they're dangerous to the people who are in here. Uh, they could remedy their being inadmissible by taking the medicine for it, which I believe is penicillin, but while they were contagious and had that disease and had not controlled it, uh, they'd be inadmissible on health grounds. Also inadmissible on health grounds are uh, drug addicts and alcoholics. There are people who are inadmissible because they're serious criminals, people, murderers from other countries, so on and so forth. There are people that plan on, that will tell, tell the government straight up, if I get in there, I'm going to try and overthrow your government by force. Those people are inadmissible on national security grounds, uh, all sorts of other, uh, really it gets much nastier from there, people who intend to engage in polygamy, torture, human and drug trafficking. They're, so those are the types of people who are inadmissible. There has always been in our immigration law uh, a ground for inadmissibility if someone was quote unquote likely to become a public charge. And what that means is that um, they're, they're, not, they're likely to need social services to even survive. There are, the, 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 the government has concluded for various reasons that this person really won't be able to get around in our modern society without the government giving them support. But how do you determine who's quote unquote likely to become a public charge, particularly when you're dealing with people in some cases that come from countries that are uh, very, very socialized and have never even had a chance to be anything but a public charge. So the economies that didn't support, everybody's a public charge in some of the, some of the communist or socialist countries. Well, they did, and that was what the new rule said. It said if you enter here um, and you, you start taking up a lot of social services. And I, I don't have that list in front of me right now, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. But then at the same time, maybe uh, this would spark your curiosity and you go back through the Allegheny Immigration Group Facebook page and, and look at my comments on public charge. There are probably three or four posts down. Um, but uh, yeah, they, so it's, it, it can be rough. Now the flip side of that is it, it really doesn't apply to all that many people. Um, the people that really need this and really should have a break from being held to that standard do get a break. So if you are a refugee, uh, an asylee, you get a waiver, even if you are going to be a public charge, we, we don't hold that against you. If you are a battered spouse, uh, uh, pregnant women, uh, things, uh, children of people, you know those people are exempt from the public charge determination even though they um, they are likely to become a public charge for obvious policy reasons. So again, the public charge rules always existed. Most people who entered the United States, particularly people who entered as tourists, um, weren't held to any standard, and they still aren't. But if they get in here and start using social services, then they're going to be. Um, and I mean, if you sponsored a spouse, you would have to, the citizen that sponsors a spouse, has to demonstrate that the citizen spouse has enough income to take care of both parties if a visa is given to his intending or actual uh, foreign spouse. So that's the way you overcome the public charge um, category of admissibility for marriage-based immigration, fiancé visas, marriage visas. 
that is the American citizen spouse is showing that they have enough money and that is accepted. They also believe it or not sign a contract that if they stop having enough money and you do go on social services that the government can sue them to uh, recover any money given to uh, the foreign uh, spouse that does eventually need social services. So that, that can be a trap for the unwary. Another example would be the employment uh, based immigration situation where the employer would have to demonstrate their solvency and their ability to pay at or above the prevailing wage for the job description. Those people are unlikely to become a public charge because the employer is there. They have a job. I mean, that's what they're coming for. So who are we left with? You know, you take out everybody who's coming as a fiancé, everybody who's coming as a husband or wife, everybody who's coming for a job, and everybody who's coming as refugees, SILEs, and these other categories. We're well, left with tourists. Um, so I guess this can be thought of as mean spirit, and in, in, in fact, it probably is. It's certainly a statement of policy because this was never really enforced before. But uh, I, I wouldn't go having a cow about these these minor changes to public charge rules. All right, let's see what else I got here that's fun for you. Uh, actually, that's all I had today, and and my my live, I'm sorry to say, was underattended. I always find that people watch these more uh, after I'm off, but I, if you're around in the future and you see me on, jump in. You know, you just type a question, say, hey, Joe. People have in the past. We've had some lively discussions, and that can be, uh, that can be great fun. Uh, even uh, once in a while, some jokes and things went back and forth about uh, illegal aliens and Area 51 and so on and so forth. But again, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm a lawyer with Allegheny Immigration Group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my practice is primarily family and humanitarian-based immigration. Telephone number of my office is 412-586-4131. As always, I ask that you share and share and share and like my videos. Uh, that's very valuable to us, and I think it would be valuable to your friends, um, particularly those who have immigration needs or, or, or who have loved ones with immigration needs. But uh, I do thank you for tuning in. It, it's, it's always fun doing these, and I do get a lot of neat feedback. So if you missed the live and you're watching this later, feel free to, to, to ask a question in any way because I'll, I'll get it and I'll, I'll try and answer it. Um, thank you very much for watching, and you'll see me next time. Oh, and don't forget, we have that event on Friday, September 27th, 5 to 10 p.m. in Market Square in downtown Pittsburgh. The... Um, if you're from out of town, I, I give people the address of the Mexican restaurant in there. I, I think it's at Chipotle, and that I believe is 210 Forbes. So if you put that 210 Forbes, F-O-R-B-E-S Avenue in Pittsburgh, that should get you there on GPS. And if you want directions, you can just call our office, 412-586-4131. Um, thank you all. It, it was a pleasure doing this, and uh, I hope to hear from you. Bye-bye. Uh,